Okay, good morning everyone again. This is Mia Zelensky with Texas Sea Grant. Uh, I am hosting this webinar for you and so that you can learn how to submit a competitive application for the John A. Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. Uh, we had waited just a few minutes to see if we could get some more participants coming in. It looks like we've got a good group, so we will go ahead and get started. First of all, the webinar is being recorded and we will have this publicly available on our website, our Texas Sea Grant funding uh, webpage following the webinar. Uh, we currently have uh, last year's PowerPoint presentation and the recording still on our webpage. So uh, we will get this one for you and, and put that on our webpage as well. Save your questions uh, for after the presentation. There'll be plenty of time for a Q&A. And as you probably are familiar with Zoom and, and webinar meetings, you can just click on the chat tab and proceed by typing your question. I have everyone on mute. And once we finish the webinar, we'll open that up for questions and answers. So again, my name is Mia Zelensky. I'm the Assistant Director at Texas Sea Grant for Research and Fiscal Administration. I am the Research Coordinator and I help assist with uh, proposals and applications that are submitted to fellowship competitions as well as other research competitions. So the most important advice, I'm, I'm going to be going over each of these slides and rather than simply having you uh, follow the instructions and read the guidelines, I, I do want to just kind of go over everything so that even though it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious and it's kind of uh, difficult at times to try to pull everything together and, and, and uh, put an application together for a competition, but we're here to help you. And that's why I'm, I'm presenting this webinar for you. So really the most important advice, read the funding opportunity announcement, those instructions. Uh, they're, they're straightforward and I will highlight each of those sections here uh, during the webinar. Read and study the evaluation criteria that is uh, on pages 11 and 12 of the federal funding opportunity guidelines. It hones in on what the reviewers who would be selecting the applications for consideration, what those reviewers are looking for, how they're going to evaluate your, the components within your application. So read the funding opportunity announcement, read and study the evaluation criteria, review our webpage. We have, um, our Texas Sea Grant webpage here. I've got the link on, on the webinar page, but this is our webpage that is for the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. And we have all of the information highlighted here. Uh, there's our prior webinar. It explains the fellowship. Here's the federal funding announcement for you to download and, and read. Uh, it goes over the, the guidelines, how to apply, how to submit, what to submit, and that's what we'll be going over um, in this webinar. So then follow, follow the directions and the guidelines and then ask questions prior to submitting your proposal uh, to the Texas Sea Grant Program. We're here to assist. So if there's something, anything you do not understand, please email me because once you've submitted your application to the Texas Sea Grant Program at the end of February, we're not even allowed to make any changes. We are at the state, all the state Sea Grant programs are required to submit the application as is, unchanged from the applicant's original file. So if you have questions, uh, please reach out to me. 
how to submit an application, you will be submitting your file to me, to the State Sea Grant Program Office, and not directly into grants.gov. Submit the required application elements to me by February 21, five o'clock Central Standard Time. All six elements of the application must be completed by the student and submitted in one combined PDF document in the exact order as noted in the guidelines and also I've outlined them on the next slide. Texas Sea Grant will complete uh, two of the sub-elements, or were actually three of the sub-elements of your application. The Texas Sea Grant Director Letter of Recommendation will be prepared by our program, by our director. The budget narrative, which will consist of the 90-4 budget form and the budget justification, so you do not have to worry about those forms. Also, the guidelines references a project summary short form. It's kind of like a, a, a proposal abstract. This form is not required at the proposal stage, and I have this uh, outlined also on our webpage. So uh, again, you can review our webpage as well as this document, but note that the director letter, the budget form and the budget justification, as well as the 90-2 project summary form, you do not have to worry about. Once we find out who the finalists are in June, the Sea Grant program will fill out that last project summary form on your behalf. And then as far as how your application is submitted to NOAA, our Texas A&M Sponsored Research Services Office will complete the grants.gov application file and submit all of your documents within that file via grants.gov uh, by five o'clock April 3rd. So that's actually how you submit an application. Now the application components, again, I have this outlined as per the uh, federal funding opportunity guidelines and I've summarized it here. The required elements each of these five, we will want you to com compile and combine into one PDF document, and that is what you submit to me via an email. So two signed letters of recommendation, including one from your students, from your major professor, professor, your faculty advisor. If no major professor exists, a faculty person most academically familiar with you may be substituted. Secondly, the next component element is a personal education and career goal statement, uh, emphasizing your abilities and your expectations from the fellowship. It has to be uh, a thousand words or less. Uh, it's not necessary for you to state whether you want to be a fellow in the legislative or executive branches of government. That's no longer required. Um, if, if you'd like, you can, with your backgrounds, state what you're looking for in your career and goal statement, but it's not required for you to, to make a, a designation statement. Uh, the state directors may indicate a preference possibly, but again, that's not required. We want you to to leave your options open. Then thirdly, there's your CV, your personal and academics uh, curricula vitae, two pages maximum. And the fourth element are your undergraduate and graduate transcripts. Please provide a clear scanned copy of your school transcripts. This year, official transcripts are not required, it's not stated as such in the guidelines. So I would recommend, although it's not required to be official, it's preferred, but again, it's, it's not a requirement for that official transcript to be in your application. A scanned copy uh, will suffice. And then lastly, your listing of classes and or plans 
for the spring, summer, and fall of 2020, not to exceed one page. So these required elements, this information is taken exactly from our Texas Sea Grant webpage and also from, from the federal funding guidelines. And I will now be going over each of these elements and, and will highlight what the panel reviewers want to see in each of these areas. And I will also bring in the review criteria that I referenced on page 11 and 12 of the instructions of the guidelines. I will also incorporate and review here what the panelists are looking for for each of these elements, the content, and how they are going to look at you as compared to another applicant. So the review process, there are two stages. Once the application is submitted to the state Sea Grant program, our program will, will review for consistency in application requirements per the guidelines, and we'll review the application with the same review criteria as outlined in the Federal Funding Opportunity Guidelines. The state Sea Grant program has the opportunity to forward the six most competitive application to the National Sea Grant Office. There's also an ability if there's a student who is a, a, attending a, a university at a state or in a state that does not have a Sea Grant program, say for example, Colorado, that student could request from the federal office to apply in a state of their choosing that has a Sea Grant program and that has occurred before. Um, and so, so that's perfectly fine. The second stage of the review process is at the national level where all of the applications nationwide across the 33 Sea Grant programs, they will review and have a panel discussion and select the top applicants, not less than 35, with approximately half of those to be assigned to the legislative branch. So you're looking at nearly 200 applications nationwide. So competition is tough. Uh, Texas Sea Grant has had a fellow nearly every year of our existence, which is going on 50 years starting next year. Uh, but the Texas Sea Grant program wants you to be competitive and successful. So you're, we want your application to stand out. And so this morning we will review uh, different points to help you develop a competitive application. So who are on the review panels? The state panel, uh, state Sea Grant program panel may consist of the Texas Sea Grant director, a former Canals fellow, and or a former Texas Sea Grant funded researcher. The national panel review panel consists of Sea Grant directors and associate directors, the National Sea Grant Advisory Board members, and a former and a current Canals Fellow. So it's a, a broad group. And again, you want to gear your information so that what they're reading is what you want them to read and understand about you. So the criteria that I mentioned earlier, and, and I have again here on pages 11 and 12 of the guidelines, this is the criteria that, that the panelists will review each of the application elements on um, and the weight. So you can see your personal and education career goal statement, 35% of your entire application is weighted on that education and career goal statement. So we're going to give you suggestions uh, and in more detail what they're looking for and some ideas of how you can um, write a good statement. 40% of your application is going to be reviewed based on your additional relevant experience related to diversity of your education, your extracurricular activities, honors and awards, interpersonal written and oral communication skills based on your CV, the transcripts, your education and goal statement, and your letters of recommendation. And the additional relevant experience here, as you can see, weighting 
the highest percent rating, that's going to be additional relevant experience related to the marine um, type of career uh, background that you might have classes and activities. 10% of a weighted criteria review will be looking at your academic record, the strength of your performance based on your, your both your undergraduate and your graduate transcripts. They'll be looking at, does this make sense on uh, the relevance as to where that person is in their uh, uh, educational uh, career stage. And then 15% weight on the recommendations and or endorsement letters, three letters from your major professor, faculty advisor, and, and other letter of recommendation that you may get and is required, as well as the Texas Sea Grant Director's uh, letter, which the national panel will review. So looking at the personal education and career goal statement. This is very important to state your different interests, your aspirations with what and how you want to move forward with your career and with this fellowship. On our website, we have an example file of where we have compiled our Texas Sea Grant Fellows uh, prior career and goal statements. We, we were given permission by those fellows to compile this uh, file of their goal statements so that you have an opportunity to see what a goal statement might look at. So please, um, in fact, let me look at right here. Former fellow goal statements. So that link on our website. Now, the personal career and goal education statement, uh, the selection panel is, they are going to be looking at these items. And again, I've taken this straight from the criteria review section in, in the guidelines. Is there a career or life goal stated? Is the statement specific, direct, and concise? Does the statement discuss what you would want to bring to the Canals Fellowship Program, as well as what you hope to gain from this specific fellowship, as compared to other fellowships, for example. So here are some ideas for you. Uh, again, clear, concise statement of your career and life goal. Write it in such a way that, you know, brag about your background, the influence of, of how things have affected you, which has led you to choosing certain classes and where you would like your career to go, career to go with this fellowship. Address how your past experiences relate to this fellowship, the Marine Fellowship Opportunity, how it could enhance your career and what you can bring to the fellowship. And I'm going to be repeating myself, but that really is important that the interchange between what you hope to gain from the fellowship and what you can contribute to the fellowship program. This is a great area where you can provide evidence of your creative thinking, your analytical skill and or capacity and willingness to make connections between science and the broader economic, social and political issues. These are things that the reviewers will be looking at. They'll be looking to see if you can demonstrate your ability to communicate well and convey scientific knowledge in a broader non-scientific context. For example, don't uh, use acronyms. Don't use highly technical scientific jargon because you will want to have the reviewers be able to understand uh, what you've written and, and where you're wanting them to see about your background and your career. Again, um, it's not important here for you to make a statement in your goal statement. Uh, it, it used to be prior years, but this last couple of years in this competition, uh, they would like for you to, to keep yourself your, and your options open 
Uh, you don't have to state a preference. You can if you'd like, but it's not required again. Um, you don't have to state a particular office. In fact, don't limit yourself to that. Uh, and on your personal education and career goal statement, don't tell us what you've already told us in your CV. Talk more about your background and where you'd like to go. So then the bottom line, the panel is looking for a career goal statement that provides an idea of why you're wanting to apply to this fellowship, what you're hoping to gain, again, and what you can bring to the fellowship and how this particular fellowship, as compared to others, will fit into your career development. And as I said, I'm repeating myself here, but they would like to see that connection in your career goal statement, as well as in your CV and your plans for the spring, summer, and fall uh, express in those documents how your background and your desires for the career that you would like to enter into along with this fellowship, how it can all match together. The next area that the reviewers will be looking for is the additional relevant experience in marine or aquatic related fields. And again, this is a pretty heavily weighted out of all of the uh, application elements. So specifically, the reviewers will look to see whether or not your uh, background, if you have relevant experience, employment, work, volunteer, extracurricular activities, in academic applied research administration, outreach or policy positions that could be relevant to the marine and aquatic related fields. It's not required, but if you can demonstrate that you have that background, then, then show that in your career goal statement, show that in your CV, and show that in your uh, plans for the spring, summer, and fall uh, element. The reviewers are also looking for relevant experience to see whether or not you have a well-rounded background, including a diversity of classes that would be appropriate for uh, the level of where you are in your educational stages and your, and your career stage. The reviewers will want to look to see if your prior experiences show leadership roles relevant to the career stage, student government, faculty, advisory committees, societies, community initiatives, etc. cetera. Uh, they, they will look and see if you've had honors and awards and other recognition. Uh, show an interest in working with diverse stakeholders in the field. And does your experience demonstrate a commitment to apply scientific expertise to serve policy? So the Canals Fellowship is a uh, policy fellowship, but it's also an educational fellowship. And, it, and they would like to see how, um, with what you're studying and, and where you'd like to go, how you would like to uh, then uh, communicate and, and apply what you've learned, uh, your scientific expertise, and how it will serve through policy uh, our society. Some of the classes you might think of too uh, that you could highlight under relevant experience uh, could be land use classes, GIS classes, uh, policy classes. Uh, we've had uh, fellows from all colleges uh, across the university spectrum. Uh, for example, even the Bush School of Government and Policy uh, who might have an interest in marine issues. Uh, so, and, and even others maybe in, in, a, in, a, in a more hard science background uh, like engineering, but of whom is having GIS classes that will see how a policy for, for marine um, building of areas and coastal communities and resiliency uh, how that could apply to marine and uh, aquatic uh, 
uh, policy related areas. So on the other uh, element that's required in your listing of, that is required in your application, uh, your listing of classes and or plans for the spring, uh, summer and fall of 2020, not to exceed one page, there is not specific guidance in the federal funding opportunity instructions. But we want you, again, to demonstrate your written communication skills, be creative, imaginative in your description of your plans. Do not simply provide a list. Use the white space. Have this one page document, it, have it be an opportunity to describe the purpose of your selection of those classes and or plans and how they will impact your career and further your qualifications as a fellow. Uh, they want to see what you're gonna be doing this year uh, that, that would make uh, your application stronger for them to consider uh, this spring and knowing that you're going to continue to do things spring, summer, and fall of this year ahead of uh, being a finalist selection uh, for a fellow. State and restate your goal statement here, what you hope to bring to the fellowship program and what you hope to gain from the fellowship. Sell yourself. Next, the selection panels, the review criteria, we'll be looking at your academic record and uh, a weight of 15%. Uh, what's, what is the strength of your academic achievement? Is uh, your ed education and experience appropriate for your career stage? You know, what year you are in your graduate studies? Uh, does the applicant display strength in academic performance? and competitive course grades? Do the records of publications and or presentations appear appropriate to the stage in your, in your career, the field and institutional setting? Again, this is taken from the guidelines, the review criteria for the academic record. So this will be what they will be looking for. And part of your academic record, of course, are your transcripts. So again, clear, clean scanned copies so that it's easy to read. A reviewer is going to be, you know, again, reviewing at the national level 300 applications. So having things clear and concise in your written comments, clear and uh, clear documents that have been scanned, such as your transcripts, um, and uh, formatting for all of your documents while, and I'll cover that later, but while there are not any formatting specific guidelines. I'll make notes towards the end of the webinar on guidance there, but consistency is key with all your documents. So this takes us over to the curricula vitae. Uh, recommendations are listed here, but a requirement is also listed here. Do not exceed two pages. Any additional pages will be deleted. So focus uh, that two page limit, keep that in your mind. Choose your words in your presentation carefully. List your diversity of activities, classes, extracurricular awards, volunteer activities. List publications, even in review or in press, and of course, uh, whether published. And, or, and your oral and poster presentations. List, list presentations are considered a, a publication in that, in that poster presentations are considered publications in that regard. So you can list that information there because that poster you would have presented it and that's gonna show a uh, broad range of uh, being able to communicate both written and orally. Please note papers for classes are not considered. And I would recommend seek advice from your major professor, from your faculty advisor. Seek their assistance and their guidance. Uh, ask them if they can share an example CV. And, and most professors and faculty advisors have submitted their own proposals. So 
they, not for them to share their CV with you, but they could share an example two page uh, CV that can give you an idea on, on information that typically is included. And of course, it being a little bit different for a student, how uh, the other activities would be presented well. And again, present it in such a way that the reviewer is going to see that yours stands out. Yours, hey, this person has uh, relevant experience and, and rele relevant interests. Uh, ask your faculty advisor if they will review the draft of your CV and the draft of your goal statement. They uh, are, are important um, resource for you. So uh, reach out to them. And then the last area of, of the application component, the letter of recommendations, the selection panels are looking for what I've listed here with a, a weighted average uh, rating of 15%. So for letters of recommendation, I, I would tell you that although the, the weight is only 15%, letters are still incredibly important. Find a faculty mentor, and this even goes back to the prior slide here with seeking assistance. Um, find a faculty mentor who knows you well, more than just having you in a class. Pick the right people, provide them adequate time in advance to write this letter, a strong letter on your behalf. So if you switch roles, if someone was asking you to write a letter on their behalf, uh, you would have wanted enough time to uh, prepare that letter uh, and, and have it contained uh, the, the understanding of that faculty uh, professor who knows you more than you took this class, you did this, you did that, but where that they can actually look and see where you've contributed in, in different areas of your career. If they've known you uh, over the last few years, they will uh, easily know what they want to write about you in, in your, uh, on your behalf. Uh, provide this information, you know, provide the screen and or like the guideline page as to what the panel reviewers are looking for. So do, does the letter demonstrate the uh, knowledge of the applicant and, and abilities. So the, the person who's writing that letter, the reference letter, the referee, does their letter demonstrate their knowledge of you and your abilities? Does it speak to your leadership potential, confidence, maturity, self-direction? Uh, does it provide evidence of the applicant's willingness and flexibility to tackle issues beyond their area of expertise? And, and an openness and capacity to expand your experiences and background. Again, this is taken straight from the Federal Funding Opportunity Review Criteria Guidelines. Does the letter provide evidence of the applicant's ability to convey scientific knowledge, but in a broader non-scientific context? Again, where they can see that the student is able to apply things and explain things without the jargon and the acronyms and that sort of thing. Do the letter writers know the applicant more than as a participant in a class, as I've already mentioned? And also look at letters from diverse sources, uh, your faculty advisor and then one other uh, faculty member who knows, knows you well but may not necessarily be your faculty advisor. Not two professors that have worked in one lab, or, or not from two professors uh, working in one lab where you have had that exposure. So again, the letters, letters weighted at 15% are uh, still a, a valuable uh, reference of 
who you are and what you want to do and how you want to be a fellow, a canal scholar. So other things uh, that the reviewers would be looking for um, are acronyms defined. I mean, they can be contained, but definitely define them in, in the structure of the sentence that you're writing. Uh, context is important. Are there misspelled words and or grammatical errors? You know, these days with uh, the wonderful automatic word checking uh, for spelling and grammar doesn't necessarily, you know, word may think it's a correct spelling, but grammatically it's not correct. And so just, you know, step back, have a a colleague review your statement in your CV, have your faculty advisor, you know, uh, even you step back, let it, you know, put it down for a while and then come back to it and just look at it from just a very objective high level as if it wasn't your application and you were reviewing your friend's application. Um, I had mentioned earlier on consistency. So in the federal funding opportunity guidelines, instructions do not state anything about formatting requirements. A lot of proposals, federal funding opportunities for research uh, competitions are very specific on what type of font to use and that sort of thing. And I think the Canals Fellowship, they're allowing that to not be as strict, but I would recommend to use the standard formatting because again, when you've got multiple applications that the reviewers are reviewing, so a, a, an application that would stand out to them and make easy to review is something that's consistent. So all of your uh, pages in your application, your goal statement, your CV, your uh, classes and plans for the spring, summer, and fall, have those all have the same standard 12-point font, have them all have the same type of font. It doesn't matter whether it's Arial or Times, uh, Roman numeral, uh, Roman, but be just be consistent on all your documents and have one inch margins on all your documents as much as you can, again, for consistency. But remember too, your CV can only be two pages and your classes and plans can only be one page. So again, my most important advice to you is to read the funding opportunity announcement, follow the directions that are outlined in that uh, announcement, reread the criteria pages of which we just have reviewed, review this presentation in PowerPoint again, ask questions, I've got my contact information here. And again, we will put the recording as well as this updated uh, PowerPoint on our website. And so lastly, you may, if you haven't already started adding uh, questions, type in your questions. And we'll just allow you to begin typing in your questions. So I have one question right now regarding the listing of classes and plans for the spring, summer, and fall. How detailed should the listing be? Should it basically include everything you would add to a CV? It can be similar to the information that you would want to add to your CV. Again, let me see if I can go back to that page. Again, they, they don't want you simply to provide a list. Um, use the white space. Demonstrate your written communication skills. Be imaginative. So you might 
provide a list and then also a comment as to after the list or within that list, you know, your spring list information, comments to support why you're doing that and what you hope to gain from that, your summer list of information, same sort of thing if you want to write comments to uh, describe the purpose of that class or that plan that you have listed, how it will impact your career and further your qualifications as a fellow. They're interested in you. They want to see what you have to offer. So here's a place where you can sell yourself, um, not just provide a list. And then again, also not to exceed one page. Another question I see here is whether the letters of recommendations can be sent directly to me or do they have to be included with the rest of the application materials? That's a great question. Um, I have, let's see, the, the website, let me look here if I have under how to submit what to submit. So the, max, the, the, the two signed letters of recommendation, I would prefer, it would be easier if we could have all of these elements combined in one PDF, but we honor that your uh, professor, the referee may want to uh, desire, they may desire confidentiality so those, those referees design confidentiality may send letters directly to me by clicking on this link. And it, you can either just send it to me or click on this or have the referee click on this link, which opens up an, an email uh, confidential letter of support. And what would be helpful for me if the referees will be sending the letters separately is in your PDF application file, if you could have a placeholder page that has a header, uh, letter, letter of reference, or letter of support from Dr. John Doe, and then I'll know once I get that letter, I will insert that into your application. Okay, another question. How formal or informal should the personal statement be? Is it okay to be colloquial or should I stick to academic language? I, I think both. Uh, again, uh, they're, gonna, they're going to be looking at these specific Uh, points. Is the statement specific, direct, and concise? Does it discuss the, the education and goals that you have and what you can bring to and gain from the fellowship? Um, we're wanting you to express, express your background, express yourself, provide evidence of critical thinking, demonstrate ability to communicate and convey scientific knowledge in a broader non-scientific context. Um, so I think it can be both present, pre presented both in a professional manner as well as a personal manner. Again, I mean, gosh, the elements listed as personal education and career goal statements. So they, they know it will be uh, more personal in that regard. And again, uh, on our web page, I have examples of our, our of some of our prior Texas Sea Grant Canals fellows over the years. This file uh, have other uh, Canals fellows their actual goal statements that they gave us permission to combine into this file for you all to look at and get an idea. So. This one, objectives, background, uh, and they're all presented a little bit differently. This one is a little more just written text. Uh, 
as well as this one. So everyone's going to be a little bit different. Another question, how important is it to focus on interest in marine versus Great Lakes policy? I don't, I, I think just conveying your, and the relevant experience that they're gonna be looking at, um, they're going to be looking at whether you have that background experience that's relevant to marine or aquatic related fields. Uh, if, if you have an interest or have background that would uh, focus on marine issues, whether it's coastal versus Great Lakes, it's, I, I think it's really just up, up, open and, and up to you on how you want to describe that. But again, don't limit yourself, you can express your interest, your background, and in, in how that may contribute to the fellowship, but also don't necessarily limit yourself. Also express that you're open. Uh, another question, will having policy experience help or hinder your, cho your chance of becoming a fellow? You know, just, you know, again, be open with everything. The, the fellowship is an educational and policy related uh, marine fellowship. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have uh, the policy experience. Um, that fellowship will provide that. You may have other experience that's not specifically policy related, um, but if you step back and kind of look at your skill set and what you've learned from your volunteer activities or or other activities and how it could translate into uh, policy potential. Um, that can be described possibly. Another question, can the personal statement focus on career goals that are marine related, but may not be necessarily included in the scope that the fellowship currently covers? I'm not sure I understand that, but it may be because, again, as, as the John A. Knauss Marine Policy Fellowship is exactly that, uh, it can be, you can have goals that are marine related, but it, again, the, the fellowship itself is educational and marine policy related, so it, you don't have to exactly have a specific match. They're going to look at your background and, and see uh, and see what they can gain from your background and your interests. So I think just being open and in in describing your background so that they can maybe deduce how that can be beneficial to the fellowship. Another question. Is it possible for more than one student from a, from a particular department at a university to be selected as, as one of the six applicants to move on to the national? Or, yeah, so up to six applicants from Texas, whether they're at the same university, whether they're at the same department, it doesn't matter. So the state Sea Grant programs are allowed to submit up to six applicants. And it doesn't matter if there's an overlap of, of candidates. If they're strong candidates, we will uh, review the application and make decisions to forward those on. So we have wrapped up the webinar even within an hour. I hope I have covered what you're thinking might be useful for you. Please do not hesitate 
to email me with additional questions. We'll wait a little bit longer in case anyone's trying to think of anything else or typing something else. And yes, we have another one. Let's see. What's the most common thing that I've seen in previous applicants that hindered them from being selected as a finalist? You know, it, we have had great applicants. Um, competition is tough. I, I would look at um, what is important, look over the guidelines, that review criteria for each of the sections. Um, we want your application to stand out and be interesting to the reader and make it easier for the reader to know about you. And one of the ways you can do that is, amazingly enough, the miscellaneous things that are listed here, because it's so much easier for a reviewer to not see something that's misspelled or not defined or formatting that's all over the place. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but um, if you were reading an encyclopedia and the pages look different, from one encyclopedia to another, or the formatting was different, you know, just, you know, it's almost distracting. You want, you want to present to the reader you and do it in a way that is going to make it stand out to the reader, easily understandable to the reader. Again, seek uh, counsel from, from your academic advisor, your major professor, uh, have a colleague proofread your statement in your CV. Another question, how often do you see applicants from Baylor? I've been looking for students that attended Baylor and received the fellowship and I've been having trouble finding any. I was hoping to find a fellow from Baylor to communicate with. Um, you know, we haven't, I don't, I don't believe we've had a, a, a finalist uh, or an application from Baylor. Um, I'm trying to remember because I review so many applications from not for not only the Canals Fellowship but other fellowship competitions and other uh, student competitions. Um, we have fellows who have been open to maybe talking with interested applicants, I can uh, put you in touch of, uh, with, with one of those uh, fellows, prior fellows. It, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't matter what university you're from. Uh, it matters that you've got a great application and, uh, and that it's submitted to the state Sea Grant program. But I think too, if you review those educational career and goal statement file that I showed you on our webpage, that'll give you an idea of how each of those people were, were different from the other, or they may be similar to the other, or they came from, well, because we've uh, made sure that their, their personal information was was not shown so you wouldn't know who that person was. It may not necessarily uh, give an idea of what school they were at, uh, but uh, everyone's different and everyone um, has the same competitive value. And we'll wait a few more minutes for any further questions. And if you want to email me, I can uh, provide uh, the name of one of our fellows who uh, had expressed interest that she would love to talk to applicants. Another resource on our webpage
open the web page again. So Texas Sea Grant Canals web page. This web page also has a lot of good information that was provided to us from the National Sea Grant Canals Fellows Program. So if you click on this website, there's wonderful further information, uh, guidelines, uh, and I'll open that right now. Prospective fellows, information here, creating an application. And a lot of it is what I have already put on our Texas Sea Grant website. Um, going back to our website, I have a, a lot of resources linked on our web page. So under how to apply, I have a document here on hints for creating an application. I think this one also takes you to NOAA. They have provided, okay, so there, that's that same link. Uh, there's a specific, the actual fellowship program, that link shows prior Canals Fellows, they have a little overview document, I think that's the same Prospective Fellow website, Selective Finalists and Current Fellows, different host offices, Uh, the other resources I have. We have a blog that we encourage our prior Texas Sea Grant Canals Fellows to blog about their experiences during the fellowship. This is a great blog uh, of history that you can read about. A news article, uh, Sea Grant Fellows reflect on their uh, their, their year-long marine policy experience. This was actually in the A&M Battalion. So I think that's her article about her experience. But going back to the blog, this is great. Um, so Matt was from University of Texas Marine Science Institute. His, his experiences, uh, Natalie Spear, in fact, I think she was one of the fellows recently who reached out to us who said that uh, she'd love to visit with anyone who has any questions. Uh, Caitlin Schroeder, so this is, this is a great resource. And that'll give you a feel for, it, it, almost like talking to someone. And I thank you, and you are welcome. And we'll wait a little bit longer to see if there are any other questions. If not, you, you all can just duck out, <laughs> but I'll hang around and see if there are any other questions before we close down the, the meeting. So thank you again, and be sure to email me if there are any questions. And have a great spring semester. Thank you.